Bonjour et, et bienvenue. Mon nom est Erwin Cutler. Je suis le président de la Centre Rauwalmberg pour les droits de la personne. And I'm pleased to be here uh, with representatives of the global coalition uh, to free Russian political prisoners and to launch the first ever landmark report on the Kremlin's political prisoners. While we know of Russia's external aggression, Ukraine, Crimea, Venezuela, we are largely unaware of the domestic repression taking place as we meet, which includes, one, the criminalization of fundamental freedoms of religion, expression, assembly, association, and political participation, the prosecution and persecution of the leaders of Russia's courageous civil society, political activists, journalists, human rights defenders, Ukrainians, religious leaders, LGBT community, and the like. Three, the six-fold increase in political prisoners from 50 to 297 in just the last four years and rising even as we meet. And the culture of impunity where those responsible for this prosecution and persecution remain unsanctioned to continue their criminality. I'm delighted, therefore, that we are joined by three leading international representatives of this global uh, coalition. I will introduce them uh, in order, the first being Vladimir Kara Mirza, Russia's leading public intellectual, the victim of two assassination attempts, regular columnist for the Washington Post, and one of the most courageous and committed people in the international human rights arena today. Vladimir. Professor Kotler, thank you so much for the kind introduction, um, and thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, in 1975, when Andrei Sakharov uh, wrote his Nobel speech, he named 126 prisoners of conscience in the Soviet Union. This wasn't everyone, but it gave an idea. Today, according to the latest figures by the Memorial Human Rights Center, there are 200 and 96 political and religious prisoners in Russia today. This too is not everyone, just those who fit the criteria established by the Council of Europe, but it also uh, gives an idea. While repression and lawlessness continue to rule in our country, the only defense, the only protection, the only hope uh, for political prisoners is international attention. Back then, back in the Soviet era, uh, prime ministers and presidents of democratic nations would put the issue high on the agenda, including uh, by helping to negotiate the release, the exchange, or at least the improvement in conditions for prisoners of conscience. In 1978, Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau personally handed Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev uh, the legal brief on the case of Soviet prisoner of conscience Anatoly Sharansky that was prepared by Professor Erwin Kotler. Unfortunately, nothing of the sort seems to be happening today. Uh, and whatever else Western leaders discuss with Vladimir Putin, the issue of political prisoners seems to be absent. As if it is normal that in the year 2019, a European country is holding hundreds of people in prison for political or religious reasons. Uh, it is time to break the silence, and we are grateful to the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Canadian House of Co Commons for hosting the hearing this afternoon uh, dedicated to the issue of political prisoners in Russia. We hope that Canada speaks out, but more than speaking out, we hope that Canada uses the Magnitsky legislation that you have on the books in this country uh, to impose targeted personal sanctions against those who are responsible for politically motivated persecutions in Russia. There will come a day when the political prisoners of today are free, uh, just as those prisoners of conscience became free in the Soviet Union. But until that day comes, we hope that Canada and uh, our other partners in the international community will continue to speak up for justice on behalf of those who are deprived of it at home. Uh, D'après Memorial, uh, l'ONG de défense des droits humains en Russie, la Russie compte aujourd'hui 296 personnes emprisonnées pour des raisons politiques ou religieuses. Ce n'est pas normal qu'en 2019, dans un pays européen, il y a des centaines de personnes qui sont emprisonnées euh, pour des motifs politiques ou religieux. La seule protection, le seul espoir pour ces gens euh, est l'attention au niveau international. On est très reconnaissant au Parlement canadien 
euh, de tenir cette audition au comité des affaires étrangères aujourd'hui. On est très reconnaissant à nos collègues qui sont, qui sont venus euh, cet après-midi et on espère que le Canada euh, utilise sa voix internationale pour défendre ceux qui sont emprisonnés en, en Russie euh, pour des motifs politiques ou religieux. Et on espère que le Canada utilise la loi Sergei Magnitsky pour introduire les, des sanctions ciblées, des interdictions des visas et des gels d'avoir contre les hauts fonctionnaires du Kremlin, du régime de Vladimir Poutine, qui sont responsables pour l'emprisonnement politique en Russie. Merci, Vladimir. Our next uh, expert witness, another uh, courageous human rights leader from Russia, the leader of uh, Free Russia, who herself would have been a political prisoner, but managed uh, to escape from Russia, Natalie Arno. Thank you very much, Professor Kogler, and um, let me all uh, let me thank you all uh, for your interest to this uh, topic, to this very sad, astonishing, and detailed report. Our Free Russia Foundation is honored to be a member of the coalition to release Kremlin's political prisoners, and we are proud to be among four leading human rights and democracy promotion organizations that commissioned Perseo strategies with this report. This is the most comprehensive report on Kremlin's political prisoners yet produced, detailing how the Russian uh, regime uh, crushes any dissent. As proud as I am that we are here and able to share with you the hard work that has taken many months of excruciating work, it is with the largest sadness that we have a reason to share this report at all. Our report says that in the past four years alone, the number of documented political prisoners has increased 400%. I myself very clearly remember how Vladimir Karamurza was speaking uh, at the Oslo Freedom Forum in 2016 between his two poisoning attacks, and he said that Russia was, was holding 80 political prisoners. Well, less than three years later, the number has increased considerably. Uh, when we were publishing our report, uh, the number was 236. When we were presenting this report for the first time in Washington, D.C., it was already 278. Today, we are presenting this report here, and the number is, has grown even more. It's uh, 296. But numbers, of course, are important, and they are terrifying. But behind each number is a human life, a human story, a human tragedy. And the report tells us not only about the categories of political prisoners, but about concrete people too. However, rather than present this report today, it would be much more pleasant to tell you what new documentaries have, uh, Ukrainian filmmaker Alex Sov has produced, or what research Professor Bobashev has conducted, or what articles uh, a journalist Igor Rudnikov has written, instead of telling you the story about people's life and about the cruelty of the regime destroying those lives. As Professor Kotler mentioned, I myself could be uh, on this list of political prisoners. Uh, that's why this, uh, the topic of imprisonment for political motives as the, one of the most cruelest means in the Kremlin's arsenal of repression is very personal to me. In 2012, I was threatened to be in jail for 20 years for state treason, for working for an American democracy promotion organization. I was given 48 hours to pack and leave my own country. It was a very easy choice for me, at the same time, the, the hardest decision in my life. But at the same time, I see how the Russian authorities miscalculated. And I continue my fight, inspired by my own story and by the, all the stories in the report that we've produced. So we will continue to fight for the release of political prisoners and you, international media, please continue reporting about them. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Our last expert witness is Jared uh, Genzer, the leading human rights lawyer in the U.S., among the leading lawyers for political prisoners around uh, the world. And we're delighted to have Jared, who's the principal author of this report, with us today. Jared. Thank you, Erwin, and, uh, and it's great to be back here in the Canadian Parliament. Um, uh, today, here in Canada, we're releasing uh, this report. 
um, which is the Kremlin's political prisoners advancing a political agenda by crushing dissent. Uh, as was mentioned, it's the first comprehensive report on the Kremlin's political prisoners, some 280 pages and 1,700 footnotes. Uh, it uh, not only the details the stories of many political prisoners, uh, and I, in fact, myself got into this work representing Alexei Pechugin, uh, the um, longest serving political prisoner in Russia, almost 16 years now, uh, who himself is really uh, m merely uh, a victim of uh, Putin's uh, relentless attempts to uh, go after the U.S. oil company. Uh, uh, you know, he uh, has been found to be held illegally by uh, the European uh, Court of Human Rights and most recently by the U.N. Working Group on Arbitrary Detention that demanded his immediate and unconditional release. And while there are many, many stories uh, in this report like that, uh, what's also important about this report is that it identifies 16 perpetrators, uh, eight with command responsibility and eight with line responsibility. Those with command responsibility are people who run different parts of the uh, Kremlin system for imprisoning political prisoners, and those with line responsibility are judges, prosecutors, and investigators that have been implicated in multiple cases of, of imprisonment of political prisoners. And so we're also here in Ottawa today to uh, to secure cross-party support and uh, hopefully as well as support of the government to expand the already strong list of uh, those sanctioned uh, under Canada's uh, Magnitsky law uh, to include a number of these additional uh, individuals with command responsibility and those with line responsibility onto Canada's list. Uh, Canada has really been a leading light around the world in holding uh, gross human rights abusers accountable under your new Magnitsky law. And we, uh, we and the people of, uh, uh, you know, of Russia, who are, of course, um, uh, now close to 300 political prisoners, desperately need the support of Canada, uh, the United Nations, governments all over the world. Let me just conclude by saying that uh, the greatest fear of any political prisoner in my experience over many, many years, some 20 years in my career, is to be forgotten. And this report today is intended to make sure that all of us remember not only who these people are and to see their pictures and to hear their stories and to know what it is that they've gone through and what they've suffered, uh, torture, arbitrary detention, uh, and even in extreme cases, extrajudicial killing. Uh, it's to tell those stories so that the world remembers. And from there, of course, to make sure that we hold the perpetrators to account. There is no quick and easy solution to free the Kremlin's political prisoners, um, but we know that if we do nothing, nothing will happen. And therefore, the only thing that we can do is to speak out loudly and clearly and in one voice around the world that this must come to an immediate end. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. We're joined here by a cross-section of uh, parliamentarians. I'll just uh, mention all of them, and then we'll have one representative from uh, each of the parties say a few words. Uh, Senator Mary Lou uh, McFedrin, <coughs> independent senator and human rights advocate in the Senate. Uh, Anthony Housefather, chairing the Justice uh, <coughs> Committee. Peter Kent, the uh, conservative ethics uh, critic. Uh, Judy Scro, my longtime colleague. We were both elected together in a by-election. I to see you here. Uh, <coughs> James Bazan was the conservative uh, critic for national defense. Michael Levitt, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Boris W., as I call him, involved in uh, all matters relating to human rights. And I'll now move uh, very quickly to start with Michael Levitt. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Kotler, uh, to uh, Vladimir, Jared, Natalia, to everybody that's been involved in bringing this important work to Canadian Parliament. And I am exceptionally uh, pleased that today our Foreign Affairs Committee will hold a special meeting to hear about this report, to hear about the plight of political prisoners in Russia. Political prisoners is something we've been heavily engaged with, both in the Subcommittee for International Human Rights and in the Foreign Affairs Committee. We've done work on the plight of political prisoners at a parliamentary level as it relates to countries like Venezuela, Iran, Turkey, and of course Russia, where we're hearing about a marked increase in the number and in the dire conditions that political prisoners are facing in the country. And I also want to um, give uh, a special shout out to Professor Kotler and everybody at the Raoul Wallenberg Center uh, for their work and their political prisoner advocacy project a project where many of my colleagues, many of them standing with us now, across party lines, 
have adopted a particular political prisoner to be able to shine a light on that story. Because as Jared just mentioned, the worst thing that can happen to those suffering behind bars for their political beliefs is that they are forgotten, is that they are not talked about, is that their story is not repeated and repeated. And that is what we're here to do today, both on this stage and in our Foreign Affairs Committee. And I thank all involved for making sure that these stories are being told. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We'll now hear from James Bazan speaking on behalf of the uh, Conservative Party. Thank you, Professor Kotler and uh, Jared, uh, Vladimir, uh, Antelia. Uh, thank you so much for this report. And you talk about political prisoners, and we talk about the Sergei Maninsky law. Let's first and foremost remember that Sergei Maninsky was a political prisoner, that because of his work, uh, he was really, uh, you know, exposing the Russian government for committing tax fraud. Uh, Bill Browder uh, hired Vladimir, or hired uh, Sergei Maninsky to go out there and expose what was happening and defend him in the court of law. And as a whistleblower, how did he pay? Well, he was arrested, he was beaten, he was tortured, and he died while incarcerated. We cannot let these things happen. And that's why I was proud when my conservative colleague, Senator Raynell Anderchuk, brought forward the Sergei Maninsky Law in the Senate. I was proud to sponsor it in the House of Commons. And at first, we've got to remember that this was not well received by the government. Sergei Maninsky Law was, was denounced by Foreign Affairs Minister of the Day, uh, Stefan Dion. And luckily, working alongside uh, Christian Freeland and like-minded liberals, we were able to convince the government that this was a piece of legislation that we needed to have. And by having now the Kremlin's political prisoners uh, report, we not only are identifying so many political prisoners, you know, two-thirds of them being held because of their ethnic and religious beliefs. Um, because they are minorities, they have been captured and imprisoned. And so many others are being held on trumped-up charges. But this report also names those that are responsible. So in the first part, we can name them and shame them, but this is the information we need to actually go out there and start applying sanctions using the Sergei Maninsky Law right here in Canada. We can take a leadership role, and we do call upon the Government of Canada to implement more sanctions on those that are responsible for these gross human rights violations. The kleptocrats in the Kremlin, those that are abusing their positions of power and authority, cannot get away with it. And so we will work across party lines. We will put together a letter uh, asking uh, Minister Freeland and the Government of Canada to extend sanctions to these individuals that are responsible for what's happening in Russia, in Crimea, and throughout the region, and make sure that they cannot use Canada as a safe haven for their wealth, for their families, and that they are named and shamed, and their ability to move around the world becomes more and more limited. Again, thank you to the authors for this hard work, and it's through our efforts as parliamentarians and as human rights uh, advocates to make sure that we put an end to these types of human rights abuses. I've been asked to express regrets uh, on the part of uh, Dr. Hetty Fry, the head of Canada's OSC delegation, was called away at the last minute, is unable uh, to be here equally uh, with uh, Guy uh, Caron from the NDP and uh, Murray Rankin from the NDP, had to be in Victoria today and asked uh, me to express uh, his regrets as well not being able uh, to join us. I'll now uh, call on Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, our independent uh, Senator Liberal Mars. Thank you, um, Irwin. I am the only senator able to be here today, but I want to assure everyone that uh, the honour that I have of standing with freedom fighters and with those who research and build the evidence that proves indisputably that we cannot allow this to continue, 
that this position is shared um, in the Senate of Canada. We continue to work as independents, as liberals, as conservatives together to find ways to strengthen the impact of the Magnitsky Law. And I think we also are very mindful of the fact every time we let thugs leading governments get away with the kind of human rights violations that are documented in the research that will be discussed this afternoon, we create a ripple effect throughout the world. Thugs support thugs. Thuggery encourages more human rights violations. And as, as democracies, we have to stand up for this. We have to speak against it. And senators are deeply concerned as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. You know, our time is limited, as been mentioned, so we'll take questions. You can put it to any of the participants. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, with the Global Mail. Um, thanks for taking our questions. Uh, I just want to confirm, I've lo looked at the list of 16 individuals who the report are calling to be sanctioned. Uh, I think Canada only sanctions one of them right now, uh, Alexander Bastrykin. Is that correct? I'll, I'll let the author of the report, I can answer, but I'll let Jared... Yeah, there, uh, there are actually several others that have uh, been sanctioned by Canada as well. Um, uh, I think we've got the list that we can... Uh, Brandon, yeah, we'll share the list with you. They're, they're, the Magnitsky sanctions, right? Uh, yeah, they're sanctioned through other... Exactly, through other okay. sanctions mechanisms. But um, but basically, the, we're going to be looking for three, three specific names uh, that are not yet sanctioned to be uh, added to the sanctions list, which includes the Prosecutor General, uh, Yuri Chaika, uh, who has really since the beginning of Putin's uh, regime, all the way back to the very beginning, has been the Prosecutor General responsible for uh, the prosecution and imprisonment of uh, hundreds and hundreds of political prisoners over many, many years, who, rather oddly, I think, is not on any uh, global sanctions list right now. And so this is one of several names not on Canada's list that we will definitely be strongly advocating for uh, in our hearing momentarily in the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee be sanctioned as well. And to the Liberal members who are here today, um, can you tell me what you think of this letter that and, and the call for um, the, the sanctioning of these other individuals? Is this something that your government will consider? We're going to be having this session in about uh, uh, 45 minutes' time, and I think uh, members of all parties are going to be listening closely, hearing the testimony, and as we've done so often, uh, reaching across party lines to, uh, to find a way to communicate at a parliamentary level. So uh, we're, going to, we're going to be uh, eagerly in, uh, awaiting the, uh, the testimony, and certainly I think uh, the government's uh, willingness to hold to account gross human rights abusers, not just in Russia, but multiple other jurisdictions, is testament to the willingness and the importance of the Magnitsky Act and uh, the use that it's had in Canada since it was uh, implemented just a couple of short years ago. Yeah, hi, Mike Blanchfield, Canadian Press. Uh, question for Mr. Kotler or one of the visitors. Uh, what, what significance do you attach to the uh, fact that three uh, Russian newspapers are speaking out, in fact, in, in support of an imprisoned uh, journalist today. Is this a any kind of turning point or change, you know, related to what, what, we're, what you're talking about here today? Yeah, you're right. That was characterized as unprecedented in the morning newscast. Uh, CNN, I'll let Vladimir is best positioned to answer. Thank you so much for the question. You know, a lot of times when people in the West talk about Russia, they only talk about the official side. Mm -hmm. You know, the repressions, the election fraud, the media censorship the aggressions, the annexations, and so on and so forth. And that's all true, but that's all just one side of the story. The, uh, the other side, of course, is there are so many people in Russia who reject the direction of the current regime, who have a very different vision for our country, who want our country to be a democracy that would respect both the rights and freedoms of our own people and uh, that would behave as a responsible member of the international community. And I think we saw it in this most recent case of the newest political prisoner in Russia. Uh, so this is, uh, for those of you who may not know, this has literally happened in the last two days. Ivan Golunov, uh, one of Russia's best investigative journalists, uh, was arrested in Moscow on clearly fabricated drug charges. Um, and he's now under house arrest. Memorial has not yet assessed his case, so we're not listing him among the 296. But I'm sure that he will very soon be recognized as a political prisoner, that of course he is. But while Officially, there has been the arrest and the so-called trial, no, not trial, just a preliminary hearing, and so on. We also saw yesterday hundreds and hundreds of people lining up on the streets of Moscow near the Interior Ministry headquarters to stand in line. This was unprecedented in itself, to stand in line to hold a one-person picket. Because by Russian law, the only kind of demonstration you don't need 
uh, police permission for is if you're just one person standing with a placard. And there were hundreds of people standing many hours in lines to be that one person with a placard to support this journalist. Uh, you are absolutely right as well in saying that four major Russian newspapers, Kommersant, Vedomosti, RBC and Novaya Gazeta, have come out with the identical same headlines today. I am Ivan Golunov. Um, there are so many other examples. Uh, for example, there's a, you know, there's a private pizza delivery company in Moscow that um, arranged for the free delivery of pizza the whole day to all of those people who were standing in line to demonstrate in support of that journalist. And I think it's really important for people to see the other side of the story too. Too often, uh, Western politicians and analysts and journalists confuse the Kremlin with Russia. Even, even uh, on the level of words, people speak of you know, Russian behavior, Russian abuses, Russia this, Russia that. This is not Russia. Russia. Russia is so much bigger, so much wider and so much better than those you know, few crooks and criminals sitting around Vladimir Putin. And I think this latest story shows not only the repression and the lawlessness that does exist on the Kremlin side, but also the solidarity and the very vibrant civil society that exists in Russia as well. Here, um, one of the the first individual listed in the report is uh, President Putin. Uh, that would be a dramatic step if Canada were to add him to the sanctions list. Is is there any reaction from um, members here today about what message that would send? Who is the Senator question addressed? Strong message. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> An appropriate let, message. Let, 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 let me just say this. The, the, yeah, the, the number one name on Canada's uh, Maninsky list is Venezuelan President Maduro. So if we know that uh, Vladimir Putin is, is, is responsible and directing all these human rights abuses, uh, I would not know why we wouldn't uh, add him to the sanctions list. And also very quickly, I just want to reiterate what uh, Jared has said a minute ago. The, uh, one of the absolutely key names on this list um, is the name of Prosecutor General Yuri Chaika. Uh, he's been either Justice Minister or Prosecutor General for the entire 20 years of Vladimir Putin's rule. And he has been <coughs> responsible for all the egregious political persecution that has been going on in our country. And it is frankly astonishing that so far, not a single one of the six countries that have the Magnitsky legislation in place, including Canada, have sanctioned this individual. I think it's high time to do so, and I hope that Canada leads the world in doing that. Just as a quick follow-up, Mr. Kermerza, why do you think countries have been so hesitant to list him as an individual on their sanctions list? Um, well, to, to be honest, if we look at this whole process over the last nine years since, since the first Magnitsky bill was introduced in the U.S., uh, we have seen enormous resistance from Western democracies to, A, to move this legislation forward, to adopt it, and then, B, to implement it. Um, I'll, I'll give you just one uh, quick example. You know, it's now exactly a year since the United Kingdom has had, it Magnitsky, has had its Magnitsky law, since June of 2018. The total number of people sanctioned under it is exactly zero. Um, and so we have seen, you know, to be honest, it's nothing, unfortunately, it's nothing surprising. The concept of realpolitik is resilient and strong. And there are so many people who still have this cynical notion of doing business as usual, of conducting business as usual with a regime that abuses and violates the rights of its own people and it also increasingly behaves in an aggressive manner in international community. All I can say is that we are so profoundly grateful to principled parliamentarians on both sides of, on all sides of the political aisle, in those six countries, including and starting with Canada, where the Magnitsky legislation is now in the books, I would remind you that, that this parliament, the Canadian parliament, has passed the Magnitsky law unanimously. It hasn't happened in many countries. And so we are deeply grateful to those who are prepared to choose principle over expediency when it comes to dealing with Putin's corrupt and kleptocratic and authoritarian regime. And it hopes, and I hope that with time and with effort, uh, we will soon see Mr. Chaika's name on the Canadian sanctions list as well, and in other countries too. So I want to thank you all for uh, being with us. And just one final footnote. Uh, I represented the last political prisoner um, <coughs> in Russia, Vladimir Nikitin, an environmentalist who actually was put in prison effectively by Vladimir Putin when he was the head of the FSB then, the former KGB. It's interesting that uh, I'm now taking up the case of the more recent political uh, prisoner, Anastasia Shevchenko. Uh, so, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose under uh, President Putin. But the community of democracies and Canada in its leadership uh, can now address and redress these matters. Thank you for being with us.
Thank you. Thank you. See you shortly. See you shortly. Are we going to be in the same building? I know you're acting.